All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Mandy uh, Ashley. I'm the director of the Aurora Health Alliance and welcome to our virtual behavioral health series. In this series, we're covering uh, vulnerable populations during COVID-19 um, information to hear about today. In this series, we're focusing on vulnerable populations during COVID-19. Previously, we have focused on uh, cultural disparities and senior population. I just wanted to let you all know that this series is sponsored by Colorado Access and Signal Behavioral Health. Thank you guys so much for your amazing support. Um, thanks also to AHA staff and the Volunteer Planning Committee for getting this series off the ground so, uh, so quickly. So this is the third of four events in our series. Today, we'll be focusing on substance abuse disorder, but I wanted to let you know that our final event is next Wednesday, May 20th at 12 p.m. where we're going to be uh, discussing people, uh, behavioral health and those um, experiencing domestic violence. We had sent out a survey to this group and had heard back that that's a population um, of interest. Following this event, we're going to be sending out a short evaluation to measure the success of the web series. So please do take a minute um, or five minutes to, to fill out the survey. So right now I want to hand it over to Signal Behavioral Health, who is going to be presenting today. There's um, three panelists. Just a reminder to, to our speakers that we're tight on time today. So um, be mindful of that and allow for a little bit of questions at the end. Um, Joanna and I will be here monitor, helping you to monitor time. So, and if you want me to advance the slides, I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you. Um, so you can go ahead to the, the next slide. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Christy Jordan and I am the Director of Development and Communications at Signal Behavioral Health Network. I'm gonna get us kicked off today uh, and then tee it up for my colleagues who are going to present you with the good stuff. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of Signal and a general overview of the state of behavioral health services amidst the Colorado, um, the impact on Colorado for you know, COVID-19. Um, following that, like I said, Mindy and Jen are going to discuss more specifics around you know, who are those with substance use disorders, how can we support them during this time, what are services that are available, including crisis services. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. So Signal contracts with the State Office of Behavioral Health, and we do uh, both MSO and ASO work. So MSO is a Substance Use Disorder Managed Services Organization, and then Crisis System Administrative Services Organization. So we contract for the, um, with the State of Behavioral Health, the Office of Behavioral Health, to do both of those services. Jen will speak about the crisis work later, including specific services available. So for now, I'll talk briefly about the MSO work that we do. So there are four managed services organizations in the state that cover a specific geographical region. For Signal, we cover Denver Metro, including Adams and Arapahoe counties, uh, Northeast Colorado, and Southeast Colorado. For over 20 years now, uh, Signal has been the largest MSO in the state, and our primary function is to manage and expand substances, um, substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery services. So really that full gamut of substance use services. We serve as a fiscal agent, data and reporting agent, and we ensure provider quality and high standards of performance. You can go to the next slide. So this slide gives you a sense of the breadth of our work and provider network. On the left-hand side, you'll see the types of substance use disorder services I was talking about. So it's everything from prevention, harm reduction, early intervention, all the way to recovery. And on the right-hand side is more of a detailed look into the number of providers and counties that we work and contract with, 
the payment methodologies. And the financial piece really can be quite complicated um, given that we manage 13 different discrete payment methodologies, but we do that to help um, lighten the burden on our providers. That's what we're here for. That's a critical role of the managed services organization. So we, um, you can stay back, sorry, on that last one. <laughs> so we work with providers that offer specialty care like medication assisted treatment. I'm sure you've heard of maybe methadone, uh, buprenorphine, Vivitrol, those kinds of things, um, as well as other specialty care like for treatment for pregnant and parenting women. Um, our providers range from small to large and together collectively over those 40 plus providers covering 36 counties, um, there's well over about 100 locations um, that, that span across. Okay, now you can advance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so at the start of COVID-19, there, there was a lot of discussion around essential versus not essential services. And it was obvious that behavioral health services are critical and very much essential during this time. Um, in general, all of our network services have remained open during the pandemic. It's important to know that. And you can see the list here. So that's crisis services, withdrawal management, which is another way of saying detox, um, residential, medication-assisted treatment, without patient services being the only one that's really moved almost exclusively to telehealth. But it's just important to know they're all open. Uh, just the, the outpatient services may be the one that's not seeing in person as much as the others. I want to add here too that the medication assisted treatment mobile services, uh, those units that are, um, there's three of them in the state of Colorado, those have remained on their routes uh, during the uh, COVID-19. Um, they, along with all the other providers, have taken all the necessary precautions to, to help really mitigate the risk of contracting the virus. You know, they've, they've, they're wearing masks and gloves and distancing when possible. On the mobile units, they're letting one person on at a time and everyone's doing screenings, um, more disinfecting, those kinds of things. So um, all just to make sure that everyone can continue to have access to those critical behavioral health services during this time. So I am now going to stop and I'm gonna turn things over to Mindy Paddock. She is Signal's Director of Compliance and Quality and she's going to provide you with information on substance use disorders in general. Um, she's gonna talk about the COVID-19 impact on those with substance use disorders and really talk about the specific support that we can all offer those folks at this time. So Mindy. Unmute. Thumbs up, Christy, if you can hear me, please. Awesome. Well, Christy, thanks for laying that um, foundation for all of us. I think it's good to uh, talk about all that we do and how we touch um, a lot of parts of the community. Um, so at this time, what I would like to do is, um, for some of you, this will be a reset. Uh, for some of you, this might be new information, but just um, Let's, let's talk about what substance use disorder is. I think it's always good to have a reminder, especially now with the world being flipped over, um, what that is and how the impact has changed, how um, access to care has changed, and what we can do to help those we know. So with that, those we know, I want you to take a minute, close your eyes, take a bite of food, and think about someone you know in your life um, who has been impacted, who is struggling with substance use disorder. Just take a moment and have that picture in your head and in your heart. So uh, we're stretched for time, so I wanna not give people a ton of time. And, and I guess for most of you, um, I can't see everyone's faces, but my guess is that was pretty quick and pretty easy. This is a disease that impacts most people. Uh, you don't have to go far out of your home to know someone, to know someone's friend who has been impacted. Um, I just got off the phone prior to hopping on this call um, with a young man who's living downtown at the Denver Coliseum, the big homeless shelter that has been erected in that uh, venue to house homeless men. And, um, talking about how he's he's struggling he's homeless 
um, he's on methadone and just really grateful for what he has, but he's, he's scared. Um, so for me, when I shut my eyes, it was that young man uh, and what he looked like and his circumstances. So the reason why I wanted to do that is just to set the stage that mental health and substance use disorders affect people from all walks of life in all age groups. These illnesses are common, they're reoccurrent and often serious, but they're crazy treatable and many people can recover. Okay, so before we want, I wanted to say anything else, I wanna put that out there. Um, Christy wanted me to define addiction. Um, so if someone is going to be given a label of be, having a substance use disorder, they really need to reach a level that can be formally diagnosed. And that often depends on the person's ability to function as a result of that order. So for example, um, how does that show up in their day-to-day -day life? What are significant impairments they have, health problems, failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, home? So I'm sure you all have heard of addiction defined as a disease, and I think this is powerful. We think of cancer, diabetes, um, they're diseases. Addiction is a disease. It's a crazy complex disease of the brain and body that inv involves compulsive use of one or more substances despite the crazy serious health effects and consequences. So like the gentleman I just spoke to, he knows how this is ravaging his young body. He knows that he slipped up a couple of days ago and he had five days clean and now he's trying to you know, sleep it off and get some food in his belly and reset and restart what he needs to do. Um, addiction disrupts regions of the brain that are responsible for rewards, motivation, learning, judgment, and memory. It damages various body systems as well as families, relationships, schools, workplaces, and neighborhoods. So. I think those are all things that we know. Um, what causes addiction? So like I said, like diabetes, cancer, and, and heart disease, addiction is caused by a combination of behavioral and environmental and biological factors. We all have heard that genetic, genetic risk factors account for about half of the likelihood that an individual will develop addiction. So, we talk about risk factors. I also like to talk about things called protective factors. So while you might have risk factors like genetics uh, and predispositions, you also have protective factors. And it's something I like to talk to clients about. Uh, protective factors are variables that decrease the likelihood for development of substance use disorder. So these factors can moderate the effects of conditions to re reduce vulnerability. And those things are like self-control, parental monitoring, if it's a youth or young adult, connections to school and other community organizations, connections that we have maybe with a faith-based organization, a grandparent, um, someone in our extended family. Those can always be protective factors. So what are some of the impacts of addiction? We know that they, substance abuse can impact the health of the user their social network, whether that be their family, how they define their family, their community, society, and the economy. So how does it feel to suffer from addiction? I struggled with this idea of, you know, what, is it, what does it feel like? I, I don't know personally what that feels like. Um, I've worked in the um, field for over 20 years. I know what people have told me. And so I'd just like to take a minute and read a few things from the Recovery Research Institute. Um, and these are blurbs from people who are suffering with addiction. So the first is from Teresa, who's 57. She says, sick and tired of being sick and tired was a buzz phrase in the early eight, um, 80s. And I remember hearing it when I was drinking alone at night. I was actually becoming severely depressed for a, a multitude of reasons. One I later realized was postpartum depression. I also came from a violent alcoholic family and had major resentments against my father who was a raging alcoholic misuser. I sought counseling on my own and drove myself to treatment, but entered as a codependent. That's just because I never mentioned my own drinking. 
but when it did come out, that's when I first got help. Catherine is 27. I was tired of being alive, but feeling dead inside. My life revolved around getting, using, and painfully detoxing from painkillers and cocaine. Elizabeth, age 38. I often wonder how I became an addict at such a late age with no prior drug use. There is no addiction in my family and I never enjoy using recreationally. I have no doubt that I am an addict. I lost everything at one point and was even incarcerated and homeless. Opiates took all of me. And David, who's 20, says, I looked unhealthy and I felt like crap. I needed to get high and get more than 20 minutes of continuous sleep. When I wasn't high, the only thing that mattered was getting high. And when I was high, I would just worry about where I was going to get more when the money ran out. So those are powerful statements coming from people who are living it in different um, stages of recovery. But I think some of the themes we can hear there is trapped, feeling isolated, afraid, and hopeless. So let's, where are we at with our slides? I'm sorry, I'm just talking and all right, so let's move to the next slide, please. So how is COVID impacting those with substance use disorders? Well, the first thing I wanna say about that is um, everything is exacerbated. Those feelings of isolation, stigma, those things are increased. The fear of reaching out for treatment, not knowing what that would look like. Would I be safe in a residential facility? So all of those things, those feelings, um, just are compounded. So what we know about the pandemic is that it's likely to have both long and short-term effects for mental health and substance use. Those with mental health and substance use disorders pre-pandemic and those newly affected will likely require mental health and substance use services. So when every night I go outside in our neighborhood and I howl and our neighbors are out, and this um, phenomenon of having alcohol delivered to your home was something I saw for the first time yesterday. And so thinking about how readily available alcohol is, and you don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home. So people who may have been struggling, or maybe I have one drink too many, they have that stuff delivered on a daily basis and can drink more. Um, so I don't, I worry about once things are lifted, how things are gonna look and people are isolating out of fear. Um, emotional impacts, like I mentioned, increased isolation, depression, anxiety, people are losing their jobs. Where are they gonna get the next paycheck? How are they going to pay for the roof over their heads to feed their children? Without a job, they might lack uh, self-esteem. And so it's easier to turn to uh, alcohol and drugs to make themselves feel better. Let's talk about potential physical impacts. Um, because what we know is that COVID can attack the lungs, um, those who are using tobacco or marijuana or who vape um, are especially at risk for COVID. Uh, additionally, individuals with substance use disorder are more likely to experience homelessness, or incarceration than those in the general population. And these circumstances pose unique challenges regarding transmission of the virus. The economic impact, people are losing their jobs, I mentioned that, um, and they're turning to substances to suppress their anxiety and fears. Um, we've seen a huge economic downturn and that is scary. Um, there was a recent um, Kaiser Family Foundation poll which states nearly half, 45% of adults in the United States report their mental health has been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over the virus. Next slide. So how do we support those that we know or that person that we thought of who are struggling with SED issues? So I would say if the person that you imagined um, is not someone you're connected with, get connected with them. If you have someone in your life um, that is struggling, continue to be connected, support them during this time. Um, it's isolating when things are open, when the world is normal, it's worse now. Um, educate yourself 
about what's out there, and I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. Um, listen, provide resources, and then a couple more about being patient. Um, and then for yourself, as we're all giving and lending support, setting boundaries for yourself. I'm going to call my loved one, my friend of a friend, and I'm going to give myself five minutes to reach out and talk to them. And however that looks, creating that boundary so that they know and I know this is a five minute call. And really practicing self care. So if you're gonna reach out, do you need to take a walk and do something for yourself before that, after that? Um, it can be hard reaching out and giving that type of support. Okay, next slide. So it's SUD providers in Adams and Arapahoe County. So here's the good stuff, right? So all of these providers I am very familiar with in the um, pre-COVID doing amazing work. Post-COVID, it's been phenomenal to watch these providers really blossom and just take charge. Uh, as Christy mentioned, these are essential people doing essential work and saving lives in ways that we don't always think about. Um, I just want to go through, I know you know some of these uh, providers, All Health Network, uh, they do a lot of outpatient services via telehealth, um, a lot. They have monies that they have given to telehealth specifically, and they're operating um, all their groups. They have room in groups. If you know of people that struggle to when they think about all health, it feels like it might as well be in Kansas. It feels far away. They might live in Golden. Don't let that be a barrier, right? Because it's all telehealth. They just have to have that means of, of dialing in. Um, Aurora Mental Health Center, they have a withdrawal management program that is up and going. They're, um, I think their capacity right now is 10. They're taking care of each other's staff and as clients who come in to keep themselves safe and the clients safe and getting those folks where they need to be uh, along their uh, treatment continuum. BART, so I had to remind myself what BART stands for. BART started in San Francisco. It's an acronym for Bay Area Addiction Research and Treatment. They, along with um, Denver Recovery Group, and BHGs are all methadone clinics. So um, some of you might be familiar with methadone, but it's a form of medication assisted treatment. And so these are folks that depending on where they are in their treatment, would have to go to a clinic every day and get their dose of methadone. If you go to these folks' websites, all these providers, I just checked in with them, they all have up-to-date information about their services and what that's looking like. So, so for somebody who was getting dosed every day, that may have changed based on what they can do in terms of transportation. They might get two, three days of take-home methadone. Um, and then those places offer telehealth as well. Um, who else we got on this list? New Beginnings Recovery Center. Uh, they're providing residential services. Again, like most of these other places like Community Reach, they have a smaller uh, census right now for uh, obvious reasons. They have to keep themselves safe and others. So, but they're open, they're taking clients uh, and they, they wanna help. Serenity or South Street Foundation, the same thing. These residential facilities struggled at the beginning. How do we help people? Some of the folks that were there they ran scared and they left. They didn't want to be closed up and have someone possibly come in um, and, and be in an unsafe environment. But like I said, I've been crazy impressed with how these providers have really um, gotten on board and do what they need to do to continue to help the community. Next slide. I think that's Jen. So we're gonna hand it over to Jen Conrad, the Director of Crisis Services. Great, thanks Mindy. Um, so I will kind of round us out and then once I'm finished, we'll have some time for questions. Um, so as Mindy said, my name is Jen. I oversee our crisis contract. For those of you that are not familiar with the crisis system, 
Um, Andy, would you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. You can read this at your leisure, especially in 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 uh, in, in in light of our time here. Um, but those of you that are not familiar with the crisis system, it came. Um, it really was stood up as a new system of care in 2014 after some legislation um, regarding. With, with a strong focus on wanting to eliminate or decrease um, the criminalization, essentially, of those that are having a behavioral health crisis, whether it's mental health, substance use, or a co-occurring need. And um, so that's one of the key elements of the crisis system, as well as opening up 24-7 access for all individuals um, with the goal of really trying to improve that access um, and, and to deliver that in, in a way that, that meets individual needs. So some individuals may want to come in for, for supportive services into a facility, um, such as a walk-in center, and other individuals either have access um, challenges, such as transportation, um, perhaps they're, they're concerned about going somewhere in the community and having um, others see them, and so sort of that concern about stigma or anonymity and prefer to have um, the support of intervention of crisis services through mobile response. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit. But again, the system really is designed for all people. I think one of the things that I really want to point out that relates to what Mindy was talking about is that I think with, with the term crisis, a lot of people view that and see that differently. And, and for some, that, in, that invites people in um, and they feel like, boy, I'm really struggling and, and I relate to that word. And others, it can be a deterrent. And they think, boy, I'm not really in, in that rough a shape. I'm not struggling that much. Um, that's not for me. And I guess one thing for, for all of you who aren't familiar with the crisis system, um, whether it's for those that you know in, in your own lives or those that you work with or encounter, um, you know, kind of a, a across moving in and out of, of your work or just general community living is, is that the crisis system is, is for anyone who's struggling. So it really is around what we would consider a self-defined crisis. It does not need to be somebody who is in like an acute psychiatric situation. Um, it really is, it, it's a gamut of, um, of needs or, or concerns that somebody may have. It's, it's a very open system. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, again, from a state level, um, I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'm actually going to have you go to the next slide and I'll just talk about both together. Um, thank you. So the Office of Behavioral Health has contracted with what they call administrative service organizations such as Signal to oversee the crisis contracts across the state to ensure that we have open access for all people 24-7, 365 to come in for care and support. Um, to figure out what they need next or what they would like to, to receive next. Um, Signals area is a 10 county region, um, it's actually three regions, which includes the Adams and Arapahoe counties area in that orange. Um, our role is, as an ASO is to not only work with our provider network for the services in our network, but a huge part of it is also really engaging in the community in ways such as this um, to really look at what are the gaps that exist for access to care, delivery of care um, from kind of that crisis lens, which is all encompassing. It's mental health, it's substance use, it's people who are struggling really with, again, that self-defined crisis. It might be a lot of people come in needing resources. They might be homeless. They might have food insecurity. They might be really worried about a loved one and they don't know what else to do or where to turn. And so it's oftentimes that kind of bridge into either themselves or those that they care for um, getting, getting care and getting directed somewhere, um, kind of that next best place. Um, and, and so a, a big part of the crisis system is to hear from the community about what's working, where are the gaps, and how can we try to bridge those together to improve um, access to care and delivery of care for, for all individuals. Um, if you could head to the next slide, please. Um, for the crisis system, again, on the left-hand side are the services within the crisis system that are authored 24-7, 365. Throughout COVID, these services have all been open. Um, 
And we've had to make some adjustments and be creative and innovative about how do we deliver these. Um, so again, if you aren't familiar with the statewide crisis line, um, that is 24-7, 365. They answer, pre-COVID, they answered up to 600 calls a day just for the Colorado crisis line. And in most of those situations, about 65% of the individuals calling in could be telephonically supported through providing supportive counseling, um, providing resources to either substance use or mental health, treatment services, as well as other um, supportive needs, such as housing, food, food and, and shelters, those types of things, talking about maybe some faith-based options, if that's really what resonates for folks. Um, again, just really looking comprehensively at what somebody needs. The statewide hotline also dispatches our mobile crisis providers. So if somebody needs more than telephonic support, that's where linking in for a more comprehensive uh, assessment of what's happening for this person during this self-defined crisis is where they can either have mobile crisis come to them, uh, where it could be in their home, it could be um, at their church, it could be at their school, their doctor's office, at Chipotle, in the park, really anywhere and everywhere. Um, part of that dispatch is the hotline is going to assess for some of those scene safety issues, is are there active concerns around um, harming self or others? And if that's the case, looking at what's the appropriate dispatch, is it more of a co-response model where you've got a clinician and, a, and an officer, or, or does this really require a full on 911 um, dispatch? And so the, those safety pieces, including medical needs, are assessed prior to sending mobile crisis out. So we can come to you, or um, for individuals that want to come in to, for more of a facility bait to a facility to the bricks and mortar and meet with somebody um, the walk-in center and the mobile crisis teams are the two where you can come in and and receive assessment and i think in a really important thing to keep in mind and to educate those you work with is that um, an assessment doesn't mean you're going to be admitted somewhere some people are very worried that if i go into one of these places or i ask for help that means i'm going to be admitted to a facility and that may happen um, but most often it doesn't. We can typically, through those crisis interventions, really assess what are those risk factors, how safe are you, can we keep you safely in the community through some brief intervention and safety planning and getting you connected either into providers that you already have or into new providers and establishing care. But the majority of people we can keep safely in the community with some of that wraparound service and follow-up. Um, care, including from the mobile team or the walk-in center, we will do follow-up to ensure that they're kind of following through on that plan that we developed. If they need higher levels of care, that's where we look at some of our crisis stabilization units through the crisis system, but also a lot of people are coming in accessing care who, who have a substance use behavior, um, whether they have a diagnosed disorder or they have some um, some behaviors that are starting to get in the way of, of functioning, feeling good, that type of thing. So they're, they're oftentimes through mobile crisis and the walk-in centers where we are getting people connected to outpatient um, substance use treatment as well as withdrawal management or detox services. If there are really acute needs because of that use where they are currently intoxicated on alcohol and or other substances, it might be looking at um, even medical stabilization in an emergency room, um, if that's needed, or, or even higher levels of care for, for a shorter term inpatient stay. Um, that would then link them to some continued care, or at least help them get connected. Um, so looking at those services. And then lastly in the crisis system is the respite services, which is just a brief, again, a brief intervention to help kind of wrap folks ar around some supportive structured um, intervention to kind of continue that stabilization and, and wrap other outpatient type services or community services to, to support them. Um, on the right hand side talks a bit about uh, where our counties are, the providers that are in Adams Arapa in Arapahoe counties. So both Aurora Mental Health Center and All Health have walk-in centers. Um, they also both have 
outpatient um, services and or withdrawal management for substance use related needs. We work very closely with both of them, um, both within crisis as well as within the substance use continuum of care. And then a newer provider in the area, um, SAFI, S-A-F-Y, stands for Specialized Alternatives for Families and Youth. They are our mobile crisis provider and they cover Adams, Arapahoe and Douglas counties 24-7, 365. Um, and so they're the ones that would be coming out and, and meeting folks in the community in their homes and doing some care planning with them. All right, will you head to the next slide? Thank you. Um, all right, so some things that we are seeing in the crisis system right now post COVID, through COVID, it's not post, we are in it, um, through COVID is there's been uh, the largest volume for the statewide crisis line that they have had to date in um, the six years that they've been operating. And really they've been operating longer um, pre the crisis system, but it's, it's the highest volume they've seen. We've seen a decrease within the walk-in, across all crisis service modalities, including the walk-in centers and mobile over the last two months. We are starting to see those numbers increase again. And some of the things that we're seeing is, is a much higher acuity, both in the substance using behaviors, um, new diagnoses of substance use. So folks who have not previously accessed care or needed care, are, as Mindy was talking about, um, you know, some of those concerns about what, what does, what's this going to look like when we come through this? And, and we are already starting to see um, not only an increase in, in use behaviors, but in, in new, new conditions, including depression and anxiety. Um, we, we've seen, a, if you haven't been aware we are seeing an increase in completed suicides in the last couple of months across the entire Denver metro area which is just super super sad and unfortunate um, we're also in talking with our law enforcement partners starting to see over this last month an increase in violence including some domestic disputes and so i think that ties to the conversation that's occurring next week um, in next week's trainings we're also seeing a real need and request even from our local public um, health directors around the, the care deliverers struggling and, and, and needing support from kind of the front line as well as up to administration within public health because of the stress that, um, that this is putting on the system and so really a, a new need around providing help and support to the helpers. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is, um, is there is an emergency grant through substance, through SAMHSA, through Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration that the Office of Behavioral Health been, has been awarded. And we are actively working with them and the Department of Public Health at the state level around a response plan for those for both mental health and substance use as it relates to um, folks that are also COVID positive and how do we work in, in connecting them through the system from the highest levels of care into shelters um, and, and how do we make sure that they're getting both kind of their, their housing security taken care of as well as their medical and behavioral health. <coughs> so that's an active process that we are, are working on um, implementing in, in the next uh, few weeks to a month. Um, and then the last slide is really letting you know where, where to access help. Mindy shared some resources and then through the crisis line, um, there's both the hotline number as well as a text option and their website if you're wanting to get more information, see where the, the walk-in centers are. But if somebody does want to have a mobile crisis response, they would just call the hotline and ask for it. And they would ask for some additional questions um, for that from the caller, but that's how they can request a, a mobile response. With that, I think we will open it up to the group for questions. Thank you all. I'm going to start off with a, a question that I have. Are all of these services, how, how does um, insurance and, and payer relate to availability of um, all of the crisis service and um, substance use disorder services. Yeah, I'll let Mindy and Chrissy talk a bit about the substance use, but I'll speak a little bit on behalf of us. So Signal is a safety net 
um, organization. And so we really do, um, a part of our, our mission and our work is to provide subsidy essentially to our contractor providers when insurance um, either isn't available if somebody is indigent um, and or their insurance doesn't have that as a covered benefit, that type of thing. So within both both crisis and substance use, that's a, a role that we have. Mindy, anything you want to add there? Um, I don't think so. I think that's great. There are um, signal, like Jen said, is a safety net and we have what's called priority populations that we serve. Um, those are pregnant women, pregnant women who are injecting drugs, additional people who are injecting drugs, um, those folks with dependent children, as well as folks who are involuntarily committed to um, get services. So those folks, whether they have insurance or not, can come and get services through us. Great, thanks. Um, I think we Doe is monitoring yep, there's a, the chat. Yeah, there's a question from Bill. Um, have there been any capacity issues for those patients needing acute services? Jen, do you wanna go first or? Um, sure. On the, on the crisis side within our continuum of care, there hasn't been a capacity issue. We certainly have had to modify, um, the providers have had to modify their delivery. So some of them have, per the CDC guidelines, have decreased in terms of like the bed-based services. So the crisis stabilization units and the respite services have decreased the number of available beds to really have one person per room to allow um, and try to mitigate any of the contagion spread or exposure. Um, but we haven't had any issues in those coming in, again, because people have been accessing care at a lower rate than usual. There has not at this point been, um, to my knowledge, an issue within the crisis system. I would agree with that. I think people are not seeking services how they typically do. So that in with um, the bed-based care, having fewer beds available, that's, um, that's sort of, you know, kind of leveling out. What we do see is all of our providers know that if they can't provide the space for someone who needs residential services, they have to provide interim services especially for those priority populations until they can get into uh, that much needed residential uh, space. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we have another question that came in. Um, can those who are undocumented receive treatment? Yeah, in the crisis system, that is really explicitly stated in all of our provider contracts um, and within the, the statute as well is, is it's for all people. Um, regardless of ability to pay, uh, regardless of um, citizenship or immigration status. Thank you. And just to let everyone know, we are recording this session and have been recording our behavioral health series and we um, are posting them on the Aurora Health Alliance YouTube channel. So that will be up um, in a few days. So in case you miss something or wanna go back and, and reread some of the great information. A couple more minutes. Any other questions? No, I don't have a question, but uh, I just wanted to uh, to say that uh, I work in a, in Western Arapaho with the homeless, and the co-responder system is just wonderful. <laughs> it's, um, we've had people that were sheltering in motels that are using drugs, and the the police, instead of arresting, now can go out with a co-responder and really help the person uh, get into a facility. I'm finding, and it's all health network on, on this side of the county, very, yeah. very responsive, very available. People can actually get access. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Thank you. Dear. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, oh. One more maybe coming in through the chat, just in time. Just oh. a thank you. Yeah. Just a thank you. So we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat also. Like um, just a reminder that we'll be sending out a survey following this. Uh, thank you to our panelists. This was excellent. I was 
taking notes the whole time. Um, our, our last event of this series is on domestic violence next Wednesday. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you.